Good morning. Hemshechaim Beis, volume three. We're on page 1317. Aleph Shinyu Zion, 1317. And um, we're in the middle of the explanation of the first Eifen. The first way, the first method of sweetening gvuras, of sweetening severities, is that the sweetness comes not from the severities themselves, but from an outside force called chsodim. That's called hamtokas hagvuras b'chsodim. So it's a method of sweetening with examples he's given of sweetening bitter waters by giving, putting enough sweetener, enough sweet water that it overrides and nullifies the bitterness, but it's not that the bitterness itself was transformed or, null, or completely eliminated. As a matter of fact, it even affects the, this, the, bitter, the bitter or, or uh, the bitter or, or um, the bitter waters or the sharp food still affects the sweetness as well. It weakens it somewhat. In Aveda, he said, this is the work of, trans, of affecting the Nefesh Habamis. So the Nefesh Habamis, the end of the paragraph on page 13, six, uh, 16, he said, so the chsodim of the divine soul um, weaken and tame and subdue the gvuras, the passions of the midas ra, the midas ra, the negative characteristic of the animal soul. That's very passionate. He said, kas, the tzicha, gezel, you have a whole bunch of different examples of his passion, and it's subdued. Yaakov livave, so weakens it. But this is called iskafia because it's not transforming it, it's just weakening it. And the, the next paragraph, the one we learned yesterday, or we continue to learn yesterday, he explained that only the weakening or the subduing of this negative force. Not bitl It's not a fundamental um, elimination or transformation. That's a muhuse. As it is, as he begins to explain now, as with the, the, the understanding of this based on Tanya chapter 10, that by Tzadi Gomer, he comes to a point where he completely despises Ra and it's completely eliminated, if not transformed, as he says there in chapter 10. So then, to understand this, he goes to more detail in understanding that there's tzaddikim that's called a tzaddik she'ena gomer. So this is the next section that we learned yesterday, all the way to the end of the parentheses, is really all based on chapter 10 in Tanya with an elaborate explanation of it. So there he says clearly that there are two levels of tzaddikin. One who completely, the tzaddik gomer means complete. There is no, not even a speck of anything from the Yetzirah, from the animal soul, completely eliminated and even transformed. With it comes to tzaddik she'ena gomer, tzaddik virale, as he puts it. So there's a miyute, something still remained. But it's completely kafu for bottle, ra loy, it's completely subjugated and uh, nullified in the presence of so much goodness and connection to Elokus. So the Bainani, as we discussed, the Bainani's animal soul is at full strength. It's only not allowed to express itself. It's like full strength, but it doesn't look, it can't speak. It can't make you, your thought, speech, and action by the Bainani is in control of the divine soul. Because as soon as there's some type of negative thought that arises consciously in your mind, the baini will push it aside. So thought, speech, and action by the baini are... But the Nefesh Abamis is fully alive. Here by Tzadik, any Tzadik, the Nefesh Abamis is not fully alive. The Nefesh Abamis has been either completely eliminated at Tzadik Gomer or almost completely by Tzadik, by tzadik Shaina Gomer. But to understand the idea of transformation, even at Tzadik Shainagam, as high as a level as he is, it's still, what his example here is, he wants to say that there's still some of the bitter water there, even if it's one drop, but to say it's been completely eliminated. 
and it completely has no effect, you can't say that. And that's what this, the next section, the, the most of the, 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 what we learned yesterday is concerned with, this issue. So I'll just go over it briefly because we learned it and it was pretty clear, but that's always worthwhile reviewing. So I'm starting, so he said like this. First of all, he starts right away, that's clearly the description in chapter 10 in Tanya of a Sadi Gomor that completely despises evil. There's no, there's no speck of it. It doesn't exist altogether in his existence. It doesn't exist. Because I feel in Avedis at Tzadikim, where in general, it's bitl etzim amahuz the nefesh abamis. As I just said, even the lower level of a tzaddik has fundamentally eliminated, fundamentally nullified the animal soul. Not like a baini. Baini is not etzim muhus nefesh abamis. As we explain, as he says in Tanya, and he even says it's only the spastus of the nefesh abamis, if you recall. It's the expression, the extension of the animal soul. But the animal soul is fully intact. Here, it has affected etzim muhus. That he says that's the difference between a tzaddik and a bainini. That by the bainini, it's only bitl be spastus, only in his expression extension. By tzaddik, it's bitl be etzim amahus. Mikol mokem, nevertheless, when you talk about the lower level of a tzaddik, she'ena gomer, it's only the miyut hara. It's because we say, yes, it fundamentally changed an animal soul, but there's still something that remains, some speck that is, is considered... Not that it's completely gone and completely left him. Completely nullified due to its minimal, minimal uh, occupying space in his being. Like he says, right. He actually says, but above there too, 10,000. But he brings, whether it's one in a 60 or one in a thousand, but it's basically minuscule. So what does this indicate? This indicates that it's not, like we said before, it's not full transformation of the gvura and the passion of the animal soul. It's transformation of the animal soul, but it's not complete. And it's due to the fact that the good is so powerful that it dominates and therefore completely nullifies this negative in the tzaddik shei negam. Now comes the parentheses. And as I said, the parentheses comes to explain that the, not just that the, the tzaddik and the gomer, the ra, is still there, even if it's one in a thousand, whether it's uh, quantity or qualitatively speaking, but also the toiv, like we said before, that even if there's one drop of bitter water, it's not quite like it was 100% pure uh, sweet water. And in some way, it's going to affect the sweet water, even if we feel it or we don't feel it, but in some way it's going to somewhat lower this volume. So he says the same thing with the tzaddik shein negamur. That also even though it's in a high level even by tzaddik gomer, however, it's not pure hundred percent goodness because there's also some mix of something from the other side. That also in their way of the tev of the yetsu tev of the nefesh alakis is a difference between the two levels of the tzaddikim, just like there's a difference in the ra, where one is completely eliminated and the other, there's something still there. As he explained, because by the tzaddikim, there's the avarab betainugim, which he's going to repeat several times. Okay. Then, digging deeper into this, he brings some Mokimach and Mavur, and uh, the Mokimach, I could tell you, is the Rosh Hashanah Hemshech in Tofre Samach Tes. So, this is the Rebbe Rashab's own Maimah that he said a number of years earlier. Actually, not much earlier than I am based, three years earlier. And here we're already deep into probably I am Vav, I am Zion. So, but bottom line is in the year Tofre Samach Tes, which is the equivalent of 1909. That's when the Rebbe Rashab said a whole Hemshech Rosh Hashanah, the, the last mimer in that Hemshech, he talks about what, it is, what he's going to say here. That's the Mamokamach, Tofri Samachtes. So, what does he say there? In understanding that Sadiq Shein Nagomer gives an example, the example of the, a war tactic where you allow yourself to be exposed and be somewhat vulnerable 
in order to draw out the enemy. So the goal is to win. It's not the goal because you're surrendering, God forbid, or because you're weak. It's actually coming from a, a very brilliant strategy. You want to draw out the enemy, so you allow yourself to be exposed, which means in some way you're interacting with the enemy, in this case, the animal soul. So even though by the Tzadik Shein Negom, the animal soul, like he says, Bittl Betz and Muhusay, but we, as we said, it's not entire, entire. So the example he gives is, like he says, meaning that he's somewhat being pursued by the enemy. So it's like drawing the enemy out and allowing the enemy, so to speak, to feel that he's confident and pursuing you. But in, in turn, you turn on him and that's how you ambush him or you capture him and that's how you win the war. And gives the example of Yeshua, as, as, as you pointed out yesterday, the story of what we, in Yeshua, what they did there, which was this tactic. And what is this Lamaila? You give some semblance of recognition to the negative side with the goal of completely vanquishing it. Vanquishing it. And he gives the example of Dvorim Amutorim, things that we're allowed to do that are completely permitted by Torah, but they still have an element from the perspective of the person can be done in a way of indulgence, like a taiva. Taiva is hetan, eating and drinking. It's, a, it's hetan. It's not, God forbid, a forbidden food that's prohibited, but it's being eaten in a, in a way that's, that's not the holy. So this is possible by tzaddikim at times that they give, not God forbid, in a form of a taiva, like he says, but, and not in any premium dick away, but they will allow, so to speak, their body to recognize that the food is sustaining them. So what makes it not pure Kedusha? Because it's not completely the Shem Shemai. It's for the pres preservation of the body. And therefore, it's in the category, like he says, Neiga, Klippus Neiga. Now it's on a minimalistic level, and it's also with the intention of winning the battle. So both things, not really allowing himself to be engaged in materialism. It's just a minimalistic level of it. And that too, the kavana is to win the battle. And that's why he says on top of the page, Venita, Yesenita, even better, it, 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 more, it seems more appropriate to say, basically, that the primis kavana, even in this case, is L'Shem Shemayim. It's only on the outside that it appears that there's eating with some type of desire. Like, like with Yaakov Avinu, that it appeared that he was behaving in a way that was deceptive. Because in order to deal with this deception in this world, you need to dress up in that garment. But it was only an appearance, not real. What's the difference between the two interpretations, the nida, yes and nida? In the first one, you could say that there's actually some achiza, some connection with the material. However, the purpose is to win the battle. And it's only an external connection, superficial. The yesenida means even the superficial is really only appears to an outsider that way, but it's really the primi sarkavon is l'sham shamayim. Basically, it's more fitting to a tzaddik shein negom or make it a higher level, that even when there is some engagement, it only appears that it looks like something more involved. But in truth is, it's completely l'sham shamayim, the primi of it. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, not more than a subtle difference, but it's like two ways to interpret this. The Yesenita tells you that he's leaning, obviously. It more, uh, Yesenita means more apparent or more likely that this is the meaning of it. Neither is the way that Rebbe Rashab is saying that appears to me. Okay. And uh, then he brings from that Maimer in Tafri Samachtes the Torah of the Magid. Uh, this is a big topic. In general, I, I touched, we touched upon it yesterday. I'll just re review it again briefly. And that is, what does one do? In chapter 28 in Tanya, so he says there, he's shayla, he completely negates that when a person gets a negative thought, comes up in your mind. So you could say, maybe, you know what? This is an opportunity for you to fight it, not to push it aside, but for you to diffuse it. So the Alter Rebbe says, 
Don't be a fool and think you can do that because that's not the Aved of Benanim. That's the Aved of Tzadikim. Because in the world Torah of the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid, you find a number of places that option. But it's made very clear in Tanya and many, many other of the Talmudim of the Baal Shem Tov have written about it, basically confirming and affirming what the Alter Rebbe and quoting the Alter Rebbe and Tanya, that that's for Tzadikim to, be, to engage with a, a negative thought and try to, and to, and to, try to diffuse it. But the rest, Abedini has to completely ignore it and move on. So now he's referring to that. Since we're talking about a tzaddik, in this case, a tzaddik she'en a gomer, a tzaddik gomer will talk about shortly what he does with a negative thought. There, he says he doesn't even have a negative thought. The goodness of his is completely what he calls his, they, well, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's first talk about this. So he says, we're talking. Gam. The ba'alesh machshav is ba'adam. Gam b'tayve. Muteres kemomen. So when there's something that arises in this tzaddik's mind, he's talking about a tzaddik that's not complete tzaddik, like the taiva, the pleasure of uh, that's allowed for money. You're allowed to have money. You're allowed to do, make money. So, it's, but it's a taiva muteres, like you said, a taiva sheter. Ha'hiru is kiyetz ze'ahiru makomol kemechinis rahu. His very thought, however, is like we said before, is something negative. It's, it's antithetical to God because it's not directed to God. It's the person's own pleasure. Yes, it's in something that's permitted. So he says, that when this person, what, what's, the, what's the solution? What he does is that the love, the divine love in his soul becomes so powerful that he eliminates and therefore vanquishes he vanquishes this negative thought, and on the contrary, it actually leads to even more commitment, even more passion and godliness. like So he, what did he do? Using the example, he allowed himself to be exposed to the enemy, and he's going to explain momentarily that this is not that he, God forbid, goes intentionally. In the example, he deliberately goes and exposes himself in order to draw out the enemy. Here, it's not deliberate. Here, it's if it comes into his mind, he says clearly, but if spontaneously and inadvertently a thought like that comes, so by abandoning, he's supposed to push it away. In his case, he overpowers it with his love for God because he's a tzaddik with a tzaddik but he has the Ava, the deep love. And what does he do? He vanquishes this enemy that came his way. Like an example, except the difference being that he's not deliberately going to draw the enemy here. He allows the enemy into his territory in order to conquer it. Yeah. <clears throat> but the bottom line is, being that the thought has come into his, into his consciousness, into his psyche. So being, being that he's involved with it, so when you're involved with a maneuver, with something despicable, basically when you wrestle with someone that's dirty, you get dirty a bit. Even though the end is a, a good ending, that he wins the battle. So he says, Like we said before, that the bitter water even if it's just minuscule, and even if it's for an intention to, to transform it and to conquer it, but it, bottom line, it somewhat bitters the sweet water, at least a drop. That's what he says here. So, so, Rakshu Bedakus Ma'id. However, it's very subtle, and of course, he conquers it, but Eira Ava, so it doesn't remain. It's only for a short while, for the time when he's involved in it. But then he says, not every person is capable of this. That's why an Amoritz is not allowed to eat meat. It's only which in the beginning is very subtle. And at the end, he, so even when there is something, it's a subtle negative. 
And even at the end, at the end, it's you vanquish it, and actually it adds to the air of the tzaddik shenagam. And he gives them the example with Malchus that we learned earlier. I have to find it earlier. Commission is boiled by Inyan Anal, by Shema Yitzchayim. Maybe it's not something earlier. Maybe he's referring to what's explained elsewhere. That when you say when Malchus receives from the highest level of Pella Elyon, there's, there's no room at all, even in his garments, for anything negative. But when Malchus is in the level of Elakim, Melech Elakim, then Yochalias Ezi Enikma Bechinis Chetzenis. Now the Rebbe Rashab goes back to Tzadi Gomer. Based on this, you can say, he says, that the Madrege, the level of a Tzadi Gomer, which is Ave Betainugim, so like Malchus, when it's up in Keser, Pele Elyon, there's no room at all. And there's no room for leaving any room for an enemy. Not the way that Tzadi Gomer does leave room for the thought. But him, it's completely not. The Efshen explains that that what it says in chapter 28 in Tanya that I just cited before, that only tzaddikim can elevate, that he means also tzaddikim gemurim. Because usually you learn pshat there, he's talking about a tzaddik shenagam who, who can have this negative thought, not deliberately, but inadvertently, and he elevates it. So he says, really, you could also say that about a tzaddik gemur. However, there, it's not his own thoughts. It would be a thought that would come from others, being that he's like a tzaddik, gomur, and he, so it doesn't come from himself. The Alter Rebbe says that in Tanya. So it doesn't affect him in any way, not even, not even in the slightest fashion, unequivocally doesn't affect him. And by him, his aliyah is not through struggling with it, like by the tzaddik, shayna gomur, but it's by bringing in so much light, that it completely vanquishes and eliminates it completely with air. So he's not even giving room for it to just completely eliminate it. Okay. So I just summed up a little more words, what we learned. The bottom line relevant to our discussion, I'm going to continue now after the parentheses, is going back to the idea that it's chlishes kayachara. When it comes to the, even the tzaddik, ain't a gomor. Not the tzaddik gomor. The tzaddik gomor we learned earlier is going to be complete as habcha. And he's going to discuss this later more at length. At length. Here he hasn't discussed it yet, really. But the Tzadik Shainagamar is the first eifin, the first way of sweetening the water. The bitter water is being sweetened by sweet water. But something, something is still there. Obviously, it's overwhelmed and, over, and nullified by the goodness, but it's still due to the goodness. So it's chlishus kechara, not complete transformation, even though by Tzadik Shei he still transformed his animal soul, but it's not, as we've said, not mamish, not complete. So now I'm ready to read. I'm going to read after the parentheses. I'll finish the paragraph. I'll stop for questions. So this, this long parentheses started um, three, six, nine lines from the bottom of page 13, 16, and concludes Five lines from the end of, before the end of the paragraph on line 1370. So it was a nice uh, 25 page, 20, maybe 25, 30 line parentheses. But now he goes back. So if you remember there, he says, That was the begin before the parentheses. So he says, Now he's going to bring this back. Remember, all this is an example from Aveda, Lamaila, from Aveda dealing with the animal soul and the divine soul for the point of what? Sweetening the severities through chesodim. So now he's going to come back to chesed and gvura, which was the beginning of the topic. The seder is talshlus. And the same thing we can understand, lamayla, so even though he said lamayla before as well, he was talking lamayla, he meant in Aveda. Um, he used the word Lamaila after the example. Uh, he said, <coughs> Okay, so he says, like this something is Lamaila Chesten Gvura. The Seydish Tausus, Chesten Gvura of Seydish Tausus, the Zah, who Rubech Sodim. 
When we talk about Zah, which is the Midas, the six Midas of Chesed, Gvurit, Teferes, Netzach, Chayd, Yisrael. So he says, it's Rubich Sodim. It's mostly and predominantly Chesodim, kindness, love. Sha Chesed Mizgabra la Gvurit. That the chesed dominates over and overpowers the gvura, the severity. But you can't say there's no midas gvura. You could say that chesed dominates and overpowers. But in the midas lamaila, in the sfidus, there's chesed, gvura, teferis, and all the sfidus. So there's gvura with chesed being dominant. So that's just like we said with the tzaddik gomur, that there's something there, there's something coming from the negative. Now it's important to mention that there's gvuras the gdusha and there's gvuras of not gdusha. When he talk about the animal soul, he was talking about gvura of, of nega, klipas nega, like he said. In, in Atsilas, the gvura, even though it's gvura as in, as in severity, but it's a severity of gdusha. So he's not really discussing that. What he wants to point out here is that it's still din. Like even when the Abish is sitting in judgment on Rosh Hashanah, it's severity of Gedusha. God is doing it in a holy way. It's, a, it's, it's the court of law, the heavenly court, looking to see whether a person is guilty or not. So we're not necessarily talking about the Gevurah's kashas that we learned earlier of the prosecuting angels that are looking to find something negative. We're talking about kavura, kavura, but still severity, and you want to sweeten it. So he says, Lamaila, the chesed sweetens the kavura, but there's still kavura. In addition to the fact, the gam b'chinas achesed in the kamei b'chinas achesed shalamaila mishdalshes, and also the level of chesed in zah is not like chesed that's higher than the cosmic order. We learned about Rav Chesed, if you remember, Arich Ampin. So another level of chesed that's completely higher than the cosm- that's higher than the cosmic order. So, like he said before, with the tzaddik shein negamer, on one hand, there's still gvura, but even the toiv is also not complete, like it is in the tzaddik gomer. So the chesed in za in shtalshlus, one hand, yes, there's still g- there's gvura, and even the chesed is not the highest level of chesed. So just as it is with Chesed and Gvur and Zah, so when you broaden it, we talk about Chesodim the Zah and Gvur is the Malchus. The Chesodim that dominate in Zah in the Midas, and the Malchus you have Gvur. We learned about it earlier as well. We said before Malchus, Elakim, is the way Malchus is affected by, by Gvur. So Malchus, Gvur of Malchus, and I think earlier, definitely much earlier, but even last pages, I think he said that um, when he spoke about Malchus, um, let me show you, I think at the bottom of last page, um, yeah, if you look at the bottom of page 13, 14, 13, 15, when he spoke about what is the level of, be- of water and bitter water, so he said, it's my million, my million is the sweet water. The lower waters is um, the bitter water. And then he said that my million begins chesodim shenichlol in bezah, or my tatayim begins gvuras dezah shenimshachim b'malchus. I'm reading seven lines from the bottom of page 1315. So that's where he established this idea that the bitter war is gvur is the za, which go into malchus. So even though there's gvur and za, but in malchus it dominates. And when you sweeten it, and that's where he brings malchus and ikramada, because dinim gave him ba. In malchus, the, the severities dominate there. Like you see a melech, he rules with authority, with gvur, with din. And yet, when you sweeten the waters, you're sweetening them, in this case, with a sweetness that comes outside of gvur. But there's gvura. So he's applying this idea. So malchus, rotse, well, let me, let me explain before I read inside. Um, the, the difference between gvura and, and chesed is also... Hey, yo. Hatsmeyo. 
Tzmeya. We, we learned about it in volume two, yeah. So in general, like this, the difference between Ches and Gvura, uh, uh, between Ches and Gvura is also the difference between water and fire. Ches flows like love. Ma'im yedim el yenim letachtein, ma'im yedim lemokim gavei, lemokim nomoch. So ma'im flows from high to low. Eish, fire, which is Gvura, rises. So Chesidus explains, and we learned about it a lot earlier at length, that mal that chesed is more tshuv, and malchus is rotz and gvurah is rotze, like fire that yearns to seek to go upward, like fire is licking the air, defying gravity, and mayim is amshach shuv. So he's saying that malchus is in a state because malchus less lamegamal klum doesn't have anything of its own, so it's constantly in a state of yearning and longing, with the flames of fire, fiery flames. Hatsukiv at Simoin of the of the chuk of yearning and thirst. Vinikra Hatsmeya. So in volume two, there was a whole piece where the Rebbe Rashab explained Hatsmeya, which is of, of a posik, the level of Malchus. If you want, let me see if I can find it quickly. Yeah. Um, Volume two is a long discussion on this. I find it quickly, yes. If not, I'll look for it later. Anyway, it's referring to the thirst of Malchus, which is the state of Ratse, which is the state of Gvura and thirst. And we learn Val Ishach Chukosach that to your husband, which means that Malchus will turn to Zah. And yearn will be a yearning, a lusting, a a, a, cra- a, a longing, with a passion of the fiery flame. That's all malchus. That pasuk comes from the beginning of Chumash, where it talks about Chava and and other Chava after the Chetet Sadas, but it's referring to when malchus is feels bereft and feels empty, so it's longing to receive from its mashpia. And now he says, and these gvuras of Malchus are sweetened both so the halos man, the halos mayinukvim of the feminine energy going upward to reach upward, rotse, that's quenched and the gvuras is sweetened through the transmission of mind churin, the masculine waters of za, the mashpia, or kamaimer. Is basmas nukva that nukva is um, like uh, it's like besume. It comes from the word um, like um, intoxicated, or the thirst is quenched. Va'ovid naichela, and it causes malchus to become to the fiery passion should become quieted down or silenced or calmed is the right word. The calming of the thirst of malchus. Can you take a question? Well, let me just finish the paragraph and explain. I thought you it. just did. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but I didn't finish explaining it. So okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And as I said, I, I, I will take questions. I always stop for questions. So I don't forget. Okay. So what does he sum up right now? Like this. Um we talk about the ultimate goal is the sweetening of Gura Bisharsha. But we're not there yet. Now we're talking about the sweetening of Gura through Chesed. So after giving a bunch of examples, first example of water, the bitter and sweet water, and then the bitter and sweet or sharp and sweet food, the kiyua, the sun and bedvash, the, the honey glazed um, radishes. Um, then he went into Avoide, how it is with the Nefesh Abamis and Nefesh Alekis, and even with the Tzadi Gomer, even the highest levels of that. And all of it comes to indicate that yes, the gvuris are being sweetened and they're being controlled by chesed in the case of this nefesh alikis over the nefesh abamis. But to say that it's transformed or completely nullified, it's not. It's still gvura. However, it's been affected 
and dominated by and overwhelmed by chesed. And that's where he brings it back. This last piece we just learned is going back to what he said on page 1315, where he spoke about Antokas Agvuras, that, that both Chesed and Gvura in Zah, Chesed dominates, though there's Gvura there. So it's not the Gvura disappeared or been completely transformed. And then how it comes in Malchus. So Gvura is there. It's, 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 it's absolutely there. However, Chesed, which is not Gvura, because the transformation of Malchus is not happening here through Malchus. It's not Malchus itself is elevating, like we learned a lot earlier, that Malchus, Eishas Chayla, Teres Baila, that Malchus will elevate and be a mashpia to Zah, or, or, or even first equal to Zah, then a mashpia. Here's the opposite. Malchus is a makabal recipient. And who's sweetening Malchus? Not itself. It's not coming from its source in the highest levels of the Helam Atzmi, Keser, and then the Helam Atzmi. It's coming from the chesodim of Zoh that are sweetening and being mamshech mad, mashpia into the makabal. So all this is the first eifin, the first way of explaining the sweetening of severities, the chesodim, through chesodim, not on its own. Then the next paragraph is going to go now to the eifin abeis, the second way of transforming the severities. So here I'll stop, and if anybody wants to ask anything, feel free. Yeah, so I just have a question about what it means, the chasadim of Zah. Um, does that mean the chesed of each mida in Zah? Uh, in other words, why is it Zah? Why is it not just chesed itself? Zah is a body of emotions. It's a, it's a part right. of the structure that consists right. of chesed, vura, teferis, netzah, chayd, yisayid. And right. so, so I'm not sure what the question is. And that's what, we're, that's what he's addressing here. Right. Yeah, this right. this so, Zoh encompass is, is dominated by Chesodim, Rube Chesodim, like he says, that even though it has six emotions, the dominant one is Chesed, but the Gvur still exists in it. So I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, I'm asking... They're saying chasadim of Zah. So does that mean the chesed in each of the midas of Zah? Or, I mean, is it chesed that's Zah is a structure. In, uh, uh, the whole Zah right. is an entity. Uh -huh. It's like saying a face. It has eyes, uh -huh. nose, and a mouth. It's a structure. And it has, like uh -huh. we learned, this is a common expression, Kabbalah and chesedis, the, the chesedim of Zah, the gvuris of Zah. It's not going into uh -huh. the details like you do in counting of the Omer. Uh-huh. Counting okay. the Omri goes into detail, Chesed of Chesed, Gvura of Chesed, uh, right, yeah. or Chesed that was of my question. Here he's talking in general, the, the body of Zah has Chesedim. Like if you look back on page 13, I, I refer to it, 1315, he says, mm -hmm. and there's Chesedim Shenechlom the Zah. So Zah is a whole uh -huh. entity. Okay, I understand. It's like the Chok Moshev Mechon. Okay. Uh, the Hatzmea that we talked about is on page um, tw um, 1023, 1023, volume two, where we spoke about it, yeah. The lesson is there, Kamesh face. Um, where is it here? Oh, here. That he quenches the thirsty one. And there he talks about Smeya in Malchus. What? Harovo. Okay. Okay. And he brings it. That's also on page 1023, which is connected to somewhat what we're learning. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Rabbi Simon. Define, please, the difference between Tzadik She'enoi Gomo and Abeinani. Did know you not understand what I said, or did you not hear what I said? No, I did not understand. Not yesterday and not today. So all you got to do is open up a Tanya, and he says it, uh, he says it very, very exp explicitly. Abeinani, the animal soul, is at full force. And, and, and the only thing is that the Abeinani is controlling Moyach Shal Talev. This I understand. He's not allowing I, the animal I, soul. I, you asked me a question. Let me answer. He's not allowing the animal soul to express itself in thought, speech, and action. But the animal soul has not been in any way changed. 
as he explains in chapter 12 specifically. By the Tzadik Gomor and Tzadik Sheinah Gomor, he says in, in, in Pedic Yud, that Etzim Mochus HaNefesh Abamis has been obliterated. However, on a subtle level, something still remains, but there's no such thing as an animal soul affecting the, the Tzadik Sheinah Gomor, like he says here explicitly. He does not have any taivas, he doesn't have any negative thoughts. And if anything, he allows something to come in in order to transform it. And a baini is not allowed to do that. So like he says in Peri Chavches, that a baini is a machshav is supposed to push it away completely. A tzaddik sheyna gomor has the capacity and the ability to so-called allow it to enter, and then he diffuses it through the great love he has for God. That's one nafkamina example. So one is the animal soul has been rendered insignificant and irrelevant in the tzaddik sheyna gomor. In the divine and by the Baini, it's absolutely relevant. He has to fight the battle all the time. By the Tzadik Gomer, he Tzadik Shein Gomer, he won the battle. However, it's not the complete hundred percent because there's still Badakus, like he says here, some things that he's still engaging with. So for the Baini, it's only in the Levushim. Machshav Dibur is where the where the Nefesh Abamis has no effect, um, and even that is with a great battle, a, a lifetime battle. By the by the by the by the tzaddik shein negom, it's not machshav dibur ma'aser lesman lesman the poli. That for sure, that's not even a question. Even the animal soul itself doesn't have any real hold. But like he explained here, there are times that he allows it to engage somewhat in order to uh, completely eliminate any 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 uh, semblance. Is that clear? That helps a lot. Okay. Zev is Shelton. Remember that. That's a Benini. You never say that by a tzaddik. Not even a tzaddik shenagam. You don't say Zev is Shelton. There's no Zev is The animal soul has been pretty much eliminated. But we still live in Golis, and we still live in a world that needs the final steps to close it up. Okay. Um, any other questions? Or we can, should I go on to the next paragraph? Okay. Omnom, however, by contrast, Eifan Habeiz, so like you said, the top of page 1316, Previous page, he said, Yes, Beze Fanim Bam Tokas Agvuris. Ha'ach Echod, Aleph, we learned the first one. He's going now back to that top of that page. He's going to second Eifen. Second Eifen, the second method or way or manner. Bam Tokas Agvuris in the sweetening of severities. Husha Agvuris Atzmon, Atzmon Nimtokim Venasim Chsodim. That the Gvuris themselves, the severities themselves, Get sweetened and become chsodim, kindness. So it's not the chsodim are overriding it, that the, chas- the gvura itself becomes sweetened and chsodim, ukamaimer. Man de mahapach merira lemisko. This is, by the way, he brings in Tanya there as well, in Perik Yud, by the tzaddikim. He says, the whole full expression is the one, man de mahapach. Sweetness to bitter to sweet, and it's the same expression darkness to light. Matter of fact, all this is bringing me back to um, I am Bay's volume two. We spoke at length about this. Just want to see for a moment. I'm not sure it's connected. Okay, I have to look for it. I thought it's right here. Okay. So what do you see from this expression? That you're transforming the bitter to sweet. Shamiridus be'etzam. This means that the meridus be'etzam fundamentally is not remaining bitter. Nepach, the Mesikus Be'etzem. 
being transformed to becoming fundamentally sweet, which means a change of personality, change of nature. Something that's bitter is not sweet. You could override it. You, could, you can dilute it with so much sweet water or, sweet, uh, or sweetener that, that, it, that it tastes sweet. But you haven't changed the bitter to sweet. Here, we're talking about changing its very fundamental makeup. And in this second eighth, and it's not like what we learned the first way. It's not being changed from bitter to sweet. That the cause for the change is dovarachet is another thing. It's not coming from outside of the bitterness. Zulose hamamtikese. I'll read it again. Not that the cause of the change of the bitter to sweet is coming through something else outside, zulose, independent of it, outside of it, that sweetens it. Like we learned earlier, the bitter waters that are sweetened by the abundance, by the sheer volume, of the of the sweet or the beautiful or the 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 the, the healthy waters. What, what, what but rather what rather rather this very same entity, this very bitter object or bitter domain itself, nepach is transformed to sweetness. He's going to bring an example by um, with a nursing mother. When the blood um, curdles and it becomes milk. So the way God created the human body is that that's what can happen. So even though dam on its own is blood, it's not milk. But the expression in Chazal and Gemara is that the dam... I think the word is curdles, or another word maybe for it. I'm not sure. I think it's curdles. And it becomes milk. Blood is the level of gvura. Dam is, is passion. Dam is chayis. Dam is warm, fiery. The cholov is chesed. And we know cholov is the chesed. It says in a number of places why that's the case. Also, you find sometimes basar v'cholov. Basar is gvura, and cholov is chesed. That's why you're not allowed to mix the two. The nepach gvura sadam v'nasa cholov b'pchinus sadim. So there too, it's not that the dam is overridden by another entity, but the dam itself, the gvura of the dam, the intensity or the or the severity of the blood has become the level of the cholov of milk, which is sadim. Kindness. Okay, so chalav and dvash are both in the category of sweet, right? Milk and honey. <clears throat> and though some of these ideas he's already discussed earlier, you'll see terms he already ter explained, uh, mentioned. But now the Rebbe Rashab is bringing it together in a more elaborate way. So now he's going to bring the topic of Ein Katega Nasa Sanega. So, Ukumoy Kain, I'm sorry, Ukumoy Beritse Sashem Dake Ish, Gam Eviv Yashli Mimoy. So it's referring to, it's a Pasuk in Tehillim. That when, um, that God's, when God desires that he causes, that also the enemy, Yashli Mime, will become his ally, will become his support. So there you see a transformation. For who? Shakatega Nasa Senegat. That the enemy, or in this case, the prosecutor, becomes the defense. It's one thing where, you, where the defense wins over the prosecutor. His arguments are better. But it's a whole other thing when the prosecutor himself becomes the defense of the person he was prosecuting before. That's called Gam Evev Yashli Mime. The Postal the Rebbe cited many times about the transformation. For who? 
And how does that happen? That becomes Beritzes Hashem. It's Ad Ha'ores Er Pnei Melech. That doesn't just happen. It's because of the reflection of the face of the king, the glory of the king, Nepach HaKatege V'Nasad L'Sanege. So you could ask the question, if you have a prosecutor, his job is to prosecute, is to find every way that the person is guilty. His job is not to find that he's innocent. And then you have a, a defense uh, defending him and making a case for his innocence. So how does a kateger suddenly become a saneger? How's their transformation? Because at the end of the day, I'm just explaining this piece that he just said, because the kateger, like he says in Tanya, that it's like the muscle of the Zena, he was appointed by the king to be a prosecutor. So, so when, the, when he sees the king's face and he sees the presence of the, the what did I want to say, the aura, more than the, 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 the not the disposition, the, the countenance of the king glowing. So, for example, when the Abishta chooses to not to overlook the iniquities or the sins, so even the Kateger is affected by that and he transforms into a, into a Sanegar. So the prosecutor becomes a defense. So it's a total transformation. Not just that he's silenced and, and retreats, but he gets transformed. It's a this, will be this will be discussed later in more detail. Now, we learned about this earlier when he spoke about Rosh Hashanah and Amtokas Agvuris. And when the Abish says, Yeshiv Bekise Shaldin, Amen Bekise Shaldin, Yeshiv Bekise Sharachman, that when we blow Shefer, so Shefer is Amtokas Agvuris, that we move the Abish to goes from Din to, uh, to Rachman, to compassion. So we learned about it, and I recall that he spoke about these different levels as well there. This is it's back um, a while Amen. back. Not to hear him. It's Mishle. It's Mishle? Oh, yeah? yeah. Okay. Stand corrected. Mishle. Is it not? Okay. Um, you know where Mishle? You looked it up? Perek Tezayin, Posuk Zion. 16.7. Okay. Tezayin, Zion. Good. So I recall, I believe it was page 1292, and I think earlier as well, he spoke a lot about this topic. Um, actually began, no, sorry, page 1287 and then 1292, the, he spoke about Havai Yechata Merivov, where God shatters that God's enemies are shattered. So he spoke there about Midas Adin, Midas Arachmin, Bnei Alekim, Vayi Ayyem Vayivoy Bnei Alekim, Lisiatsav Al Hashem, Vayem Eddin Rabbid Rosh Hashan. So I will look it up more in detail, but I think he spoke about that, this idea of the transformation. I don't know how much he talked about the transformation of Gvura to Chesed, but definitely spoke about this idea there. I'll look it up soon afterwards. So we'll stop here. By came by Aveda. Now he's going to speak about it. How is it in Aveda? Before he spoke to Aveda, like with the Tzadik Shein Gomor, how the Nefesh Shabbat, how the Nefesh Shalikis dominates over the animal soul. And, but it's coming from Chesed is impacting the Gvura. Now he's going to explain, and we'll learn this tomorrow, how in Aveda, where do you see that the Gvura itself is transformed? The Dara itself, the evil itself, is going to be transformed to good. Well, most likely, it seems like the Tzadik Gomur. He said that explicitly, but he wants to also help us, all of us, to be able to reach that level. Okay, we'll see where he goes with this. So I'm stopping here. Uh, four, uh, where am I? Five, six lines from the bottom on page 1317. Are there any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. 
So we're moving along.